I want you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. Jonah, I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't have, I won't gift you one. You'll have to buy one yourself. Jonah, that's the best investment you could ever make in life. Buying a Bible. The book of Jonah. We've been working on quite a few weeks on receiving the double portion anointing. Chapter 1, verse 1 onwards. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go now to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Let's stop there today. When we read scripture, when we study scripture, I hope you are all good students of scripture by now. That's why I know, I know, any of you study the scripture only along with me on Sunday mornings. <laughs> That's why the message goes over and up. When you study the word of God, use only the word of God to study the word of God. Don't bring flesh into the spirit. The flesh is not allowed to read the spirit. The flesh can never read the spirit. You will never receive from God if you use human wisdom to study the word of God. The word in itself will explain. Get a good confidence. Get a good Bible. Get on your knees and pray that prayer from Ephesians every time. God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And God promises in the epistle of John, the anointing will teach you. The anointing will teach you. It's not I who am teaching you today. It's the anointing that teaches you. Don't bring sociology and anthropology and higher criticism and lower criticism and all into this. You will see the veil will cover your eyes. You cannot bring theories of the flesh or the wisdom of this world which God calls foolishness and try to read his word. Then you are lifting up an imagination, an idea of man above the exalted word of God. And God has said, I have lifted my word above the heavens. You need the spirit of God to learn the word of God. So don't ever try to use theories of the world to read the text. Because God says in his word, what will happen when that you do that. So here is Jonah. Here is a believer, a pastor. An evangelist, whatever you want to call him, there he is. And we are going to study Jonah differently today. First, I want you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 2 and verse 13. Chapter 2 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2 comes right after Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's what I was trying to tell you. God says, I am the fountain of living water. The Spirit of God is the fountain of living water. Jesus one day stood before the temple and said, Rivers of living water shall flow from you. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he shall lead you to all truth. 
Yet we have left God, we have left his word, we have left his Holy Spirit, and we have tried to gather knowledge in cisterns that are broken. And a generation is growing up who know science and technology and history and geography and drama and poetry and cricket and WWF. They do not know their word. You're trying to gather water in broken cisterns. And it will sail you in the day of trouble. God says, my people have done two evils. One, they have forsaken me. The source of living water. They have forsaken me, the source of living water. Two, after living me, they have tried to gather knowledge outside of me. In cisterns that are broken. That's when pulpits end up with social messages. Pulpits end up without the word of God being preached. When I preach the word of God, I have to trust God every moment that his word has power to work in the people who hear. It's not I who bring change. It's the word of God and the spirit of God who brings change. And scripture says in the book of Thessalonians, Paul says, when we came and spoke to you, you did not receive it as the words of men. You received it as it was the word of the Lord and it has power to work in those who believe. It still has the power to work in those who believe. So every time you hear the word of God and you go back home, don't mock God by disobeying exactly what you heard a few hours before in the church. Because God says he shall not be mocked. That's why I keep telling this church is not for everybody. I'm not looking at numbers. I'm never looking at numbers. I'm not counting numbers here. I'm telling you, the word which I and you hear, I hear while I'm preaching. And I go back and I disobey. God says, you're mocking me. You're mocking me. You're mocking the very word that you heard. And he says, I have lifted my word above the heavens. I have lifted my word above the heavens. And here is a man. And here is a man. And he is given a message. His name is Jonah. Is given a message. You know what? Everybody sitting here is Jonah. If you know what the name Jonah means, son of Amittai, you will know that each one sitting here is a Jonah. Jonah means dove or messenger. Amittai means my truth, the messenger of my truth. Jonah, son of Amittai, means you are the messenger of my truth. And God is telling each child of his sitting here, you are the only message the world you live in will ever see. My message. You are the message. You are the messenger of my truth. Most of the people who are around you is never ever going to read the Bible. But they will. If you allow God to make you the message and the messenger. And when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, when the word of the Lord comes to each one of us every day, the word is still the same. Go to Nineveh. Go, arise, go to Nineveh. Get up from your comfort zone, arise and go to Nineveh. Nineveh, Jericho, Egypt, all stand for the world. And to the world, God has only one message. To the church, God has many messages. To the world, God has only one message. Judgment is set. Repent or perish. There is no other message to the world. There is no healing. There is no peace. There is no prosperity. Nothing. God has only one thing to tell the world. Repent. But the day is set. The day is set. The day is set. He says, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God says, Their wickedness has come up before me. If you turn to chapter 3, if you turn to chapter 3, you will see there the message, chapter 3, verse 4. When finally Jonah obeys and reaches there, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. On the first day, on the first day, Jonah entered into Nineveh and said, Forty days and Nineveh will be no more. Forty days and Nineveh will be 
no more. And on the first day after he died, the message is still the same. 40 days and then there will be no more. 40 days is 40 jubilees. A jubilee is 50 years. After 50 years, freedom is proclaimed to Israel. 40 into 50 is 2,000 years. God says, 2,000 years, Nineveh will be no more. The world that you see as today will be no more. And you have no other message, Jonah. Just go to Nineveh and say 40 days and Nineveh will be no more. And each one of us, when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we walk in the Word and when we walk in that anointing, wherever God has placed us, we become the message. We become the message saying that judgment has already been set. Judgment has already been set. That's why we are called to be aliens and strangers in this world. When you are an alien and a stranger, your bags are always packed. You know you are not here to stay. And in your workplaces, in your colleges, in your schools, you live there as strangers, not partaking of the patterns of this world. You are on the way home. And you are the message. You are the message. The message has never changed. 30 years after living with his parents, when Jesus comes to River Jordan and John the Baptist baptizes him, he is filled with the Holy Ghost and he is driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. After 40 days of fasting, and he's been tested, he come out, comes out victorious, he gets the seal of approval from the Father. When he steps back into us, his first message is repent. His first message is repent. He healed, he fed, he did so many things, but all through those healings and feeding programs, he had only one message, repent or perish. He never changed the message. Before him, John the Baptist suddenly disappears. He goes into the wilderness and then comes out of the wilderness, clothed strangely, eating locusts and honey. He had only one message. The world that was coming to him, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Peter, having betrayed him and the resurrected Jesus meets him, restores him, and they wait at in the upper room in Jerusalem. And 50 days later, they receive the anointing. And when he receives the anointing, the man who betrayed steps forward and tells the world only one message. Repent, because judgment is set. There is no other message. There is no other message to the world. There is only one message to the world, that is, repent, because judgment has been set. And we have to live in this world as God has already set judgment. We are aliens, we are sojourners, we are not partakers of this world. Don't get too comfortable when you walk out of this church. When you step into the world, do not get too comfortable. Because God has sent us to Nineveh. God has told us, arise and go to Nineveh, speak the word and come back. We are not asked to dwell in Nineveh and enjoy the fruits of Nineveh. We have never been asked to do that. And then, when God tells us to do that, in a way it's called a great city. Exceedingly great city, that's how it is called. Is it right? Great city. And God says, you may look it as exceedingly great, this world. But when I see its wickedness has come before me. For us, we see the achievements and the greatness of this world. But God sees the wickedness and evil of this world and he says it has come before me and i'm no way putting a seal of approval upon that wickedness god says i have sent each one of you like joah uh, like jonah i'm telling you arise go to nineveh and speak my message he says the message is mine the message is his it's not my message it's his message therefore i don't have a copyright on it he has therefore i cannot change the message Today, you know what? The message has been changed. The message has been changed all around the, the Christian world where you are speaking about a salvation without repentance. There is no such salvation in the Bible. Preached either by the prophets or the Lord himself or the apostles. There never was such a salvation that was offered. A salvation which is a lie is being offered to the world by saying, come into the house of God, you don't have to change. God says, you have to change. Repent 40 days more and Nineveh will be no more. And there he is. And there he is. 
He doesn't want to take that message. And God is asking us, where are you living today? Have you become too engaged with Nineveh? Have you become a part of Nineveh? Are you talking the language of this world when you go out of this room? If salt loses its saltiness, it's one, one thing which we all have in our houses. Everything else we can use. But if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. God said, you are the salt of the earth. You know when I become the salt of the earth and you become the salt of the earth, I and you become the salt of the earth when we hold on to the message that was given to us. The message is that one which brings that taste to that salt. You take that message off, the salt has lost its saltiness. And God says, you are of no good. You are of no good to me or to my kingdom because you do not bring any change to this world. You are not a source of hope to this world because there is no hope for the world unless there is repentance. God always works through repentance and then there is restoration. There is no restoration before repentance. Before restoration, always there is repentance. And God is asking us, where are you? Are you part of this world or are you an alien? Ask yourself this question. Sojourners is the word KJ we will use. We are sojourners, the writer of Hebrews says. Paul says, aliens and strangers in this perishing world. At the age of 127, Sarah died. She died when Isaac was only 37 years old. That's why he needed to be comforted. And three years later, he gets married. He missed his mom sadly. He was mama's boy. At the age of 127, Sarah died. And scripture records Abraham wept. It's not recorded that when Abraham left his father's house, Haran, Haran, he wept. It's not written that when Terah died, he wept. It is not written when Lot left him, he wept. It is not written when Ishmael was asked to be thrown out, he wept. It is not even written when he offered Isaac as a sacrifice, he wept. But it's written when Sarah died, he wept. Because she had been with him for 62 years. She had walked with him. He had left Haran at the age of 75. And now at 127, he's dead. she's dead. And he weeps. He weeps because Sarah is dead. And then he asks one thing. He asks the people among whom he is the mighty man. And he says, please give me a place, a cave, a particular cave to bury my wife. And they say, you are a mighty man. You are a prince among us. You can take any place you want. He says, no, I am an alien, a sojourner among you. Can you live in a country for 62 years and become as powerful as the king and still say that you are a stranger? That's why it is not recorded in the Bible that Abraham ever built a house because he was not allowed to build a house. Even though all the around, those around him lived in houses, he was only allowed to build a tent. A tent is a temporary dwelling. Because you know what? He is the father of faith. So he, through his life, 62 years with Sarah in that land, he say, I'm an alien. I'm a stranger. I'm an alien. I'm a stranger. I'm just passing by. I'm just passing by. You know what? In Canaan, Abraham was the message. In Canaan, he was the message. He didn't have to open his mouth. He was the message. In Canaan, Isaac was the message. In Canaan, Jacob was the message. Until the sin of the Amorites had filled. And then God said, time up. Move the Amorites out. I give Canaan to you. Your descendants shall inherit. And God is asking us today, are you a sojourner? Because your response to the call that Jonah got, the call which everybody here has, will tell you whether you are a part of this world or you live in this world as an alien. Jonah's response was he ran away. Jonah's response when the call came to him was, it is written, he ran. He ran. You know why? You know when people run? People run from churches. People run from the word of God when they don't want to be the message. 
Give me free salvation, O oh God. But don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to do anything. I just want your salvation, O oh God. And that's when he runs. And where does he run? Keep your book open on Jonah. And Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Where did he go? Tarshish. You know what Tarshish means? Whenever people run away from the presence of the Lord, whenever God's people run away from the presence of the Lord, they always end up towards Tarshish, which means scattered or destroyed. Tarshish means to be scattered or to be destroyed. That's why I say use the word to interpret the word because the Bible is full of symbols. Everything in that has a meaning. God hasn't put those things over there by accident. Even in those names, as we connect it, he's speaking to us. And he's saying that if you run away from me, you will always run towards Tarshish. And that will be a scattering of the anointing over you. That will be a destruction of my plan from you. Whenever you run from the word of God, you are running towards ruin to be scattered, to be beaten down by the enemy. Now look at a word carefully there. Chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. And Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. He went. He went. From the presence of the Lord. In that one verse, twice it is written, he went. From the presence of the Lord. Whenever, if you look at it, Tarsus and presence of the Lord is repeated twice in one verse. God is saying, whenever you run away from me and run away from my presence, all that is going to happen, your labors are going to be scattered. When you run away from me, you are running away from my presence. And when you run away from my presence, it's all going to be scattered. And look again. Arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He, he went, he went, he went down to Joba, Joppa, right? Joppa, he went down to Joppa. Did you see that? He went, be careful. Whenever people walk away from the presence of God, in the Bible it will be written, they went down. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the land of Canaan, where Abraham was living with his family, a famine came. When a famine came, he didn't check with God and it is written, Abraham went down to Egypt. It's written, Abraham went down to Egypt. And then God rescues him and brings his family out of Egypt. It is written, he came out, went up out of Egypt. Whenever you walk away from the presence of God, it is not talking about just a physical landscape, it is talking about a spiritual movement, you go down. Therefore Saul, who never surrendered his life to God, always went down to fight the Philistines. Yet when David goes to fight Goliath, he ran towards him because he met the enemy on his terms. Saul always had to fight his enemies on the enemy's terms because he was going down from the presence of God. God is asking us, check your movement, is it down or is it up? Are you moving towards me or are you moving towards away from me? If you're moving away from me, it's down and it's down and it's down. We have a famous parable called the parable of the good Samaritan. Yeah? Okay. See, you need to realize when the Bible was written, no, no headings were given. This was written by later editors. So whenever you read the Bible, forget that a heading because it changes your perspective. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and then he was waylaid by thieves. Whenever man goes down from Jerusalem, the point you God asked you and me to be where we worship him and go down, the thief, the thief will waylay you. And Jesus said who the thief was, who comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. A certain man went down. A certain man went down. And here is a certain man going down. And he's on the way down. He's on the way down. And God is asking us today, where are you? Where are you? Have you gone down? He says, 
Trace your way back to your heavenly Jerusalem. Trace your way back to the heavenly Jerusalem. And scripture says, There, the Lord sent out a great wind. Verse 4. The first wind Jonah faces. Jonah faces two winds. One in the beginning of his journey, one at the end also. At the end of the journey, if you look at chapter 4 and verse 8, it will be written. And it happened when the sun arose. Chapter 4, verse 8. The God prepared a vehement east wind. Did you know that God prepares winds? And you know what God calls his winds? Jeremiah 51, verse 16. We are going to look at some of the treasures of God. You didn't think about it as a treasure, but God calls it as his treasure. Jeremiah 51, verse 16. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. God has got a treasury. And some of the treasures in that treasury, one of that is wind. What else is in that treasure box? You want it all? Job chapter 18. Job will come just before the Psalms. Job, the book of Job, chapter 18. I, I can't find that reference. It's the other is hail and snow. Hail, snow, and wind he takes from his treasury. Let's turn to Psalm 148, right after Job. Yeah, it's Psalm 148, verse 8. Fire and hail. Snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his, fulfilling his, God in his seasons sends hail, snow, wind, fulfilling his word. You need to realize this. The world will call it by different names. They will call it global warming. They will say it's because we didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol. They will say it is because of greenhouse gases emission. They will say it is because of the cattle in India and the factories in China. God says, I am letting out things from my treasury because you need to be put right in your life. The world will do everything to tackle these situations except repent. Except repent, the world will do everything. So even in the highest bodies of international organizations, you cannot speak the name of God. So they don't want to hear it. They want a human solution for all these things. But God says, it is written, God sent a wind. God sent a wind. God has different winds. There's an east wind, there's a west wind. There's a north wind, and there's a south wind. And 22 times the east wind is mentioned in the Bible. And whenever the east wind blows, it's a wind of judgment. Whenever the east wind blows in the Bible, it's a wind of judgment. It's not like the other winds. It's not like the other winds. We will not do a study on winds today, but we'll do a little on this east wind that is blowing on our Uncle Jonah. And it's written, as the wind starts blowing, the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were scared. Exodus chapter 10, verse 13. Before that, let's look at Matthew 24 to what Jesus talks about winds. Did you know that Jesus talked about the wind? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31.
and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, four winds from one end of heaven to the other from the four winds from one end to the other he will gather and there is something connected with that told in revelation 7 1 how the angels are waiting for that order Revelation 7 and verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. There are these four angels holding back the winds, waiting for the word of the Lord. And when God says, He's oh, we haven't seen anything yet. What we are seeing, the shakings that he's talking about only is the east breeze. It's not the east wind, it's yet to come. We are just trembling when the breeze is blowing. Don't think what is happening around the world is by chance. It's God allowing everything that the flesh has built to be shaken. And we are watching it, nations being shaken. Nations being shaken. Once prosperous nations going bankrupt. Absolutely bankrupt. No money in those countries. Iceland has gone bankrupt. And people were trying to settle down in Iceland because it was supposed to be one of the most prosperous nations on earth. Tens in thousands and millions are laid off. When God sent a shaking upon that nation on September 11, after that so many started crowding into the churches. But they had no message there. They didn't receive a word. So they went out, most of them went out from the churches because the churches went into doxology and rituals and big choirs with colored clothes and 40 minutes later they sent them home without any hope. And they went, they got hardened even more. Now they're slowly trickling back into the churches again. You know why? Because there is no hope. You have lost your house. You have lost your money. You have lost your savings. The very people whom you trusted with your retirement accounts have disappeared with your money. And the government is talking about stimulus and bailout. God is talking to his people, come back to me. I'm holding back the winds. I'm holding back the winds, come back to me. I'm holding back the winds, come back to me. Our God is saying, come back to me before I release it. Before I release it, turn with me to the book of Exodus and see what God does there. Exodus chapter 10, verse 13. Exodus, second book of the Bible. Ten, verse 13. And Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, judgment upon Egypt. And the locusts went over, all over, and it went, and it ate up everything in it. What, did, what brought it? An east wind. It was an east wind. We are not just talking about the wind that comes from the east. We are talking about supernatural movements from God when he sends destructions upon nations so that they will repent and come back to him and be restored. And then, again you will see in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. What was deliverance for God's people became judgment for the people of the world. The east wind brought deliverance for Israel and judgment for Egypt. God still sends the east wind. Turn with me to the book of Hosea. I'm sorry, you will have to keep on. I'm not sorry, sorry, I'm not sorry. Keep turning to the Bible. You need to look, know where your books are. Why should I be sorry about asking you to find the books in the Bible? The book of Hosea, chapter 12 and verse 1. Chapter 12 and verse 1. <clears throat> Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation. 
Also, they made a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried to Egypt. You see that? Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. He's pursuing the east wind. He's pursuing God's judgment. His ju God's judgment is coming upon Ephraim. And what happens? He daily increases life. And you will see Ephraim, the world is increasing in lies and deception. Lies and deceit and deception. And they made a covenant with the Assyrians. Whom did they make a covenant? Ephraim is part of God's family. And whom did they make a covenant with? Assyrians. You know what the word Assyrian means? Assyrian means to step up in the world. Oh, the children of God have made a covenant with the principles of the world to go up with lies and deceits. God says, you are swallowing the east wind of judgment. Ephraim, you are swallowing the east wind of judgment. And as a reason, what have you taken? You have taken the oil to Egypt. You have taken my anointing and sold it in Egypt. Isn't that what's happening today? The anointing of the living God being sold in the world. As they go from here to there to rise up in the world. God telling his children, you don't need to rise up in the world. I will lift you up. I will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above and not below. If you fully obey me and walk with me, all this blessing shall follow you and come upon you. You never have to make a pact with the Assyrians to step up in the world. If you do it, the next thing you will have to do is you will have to sell your oil in Egypt. You will end up selling your oil in the Egypt. And on the day when the bridegroom comes, you will find you got a lamb, but there is no anointing. You have the word. Because you are part of Ephraim. You have the word, but there is no anointing. And the door will be shut on everybody who doesn't have the anointing. It's not enough to know the word. The word becomes living when the anointing comes upon it. And God says, don't sell your anointing in Egypt. Church, don't sell your anointing in Egypt. Because if you sell the anointing in Egypt, Egypt will start dictating what you can do in the house of God. Egypt will start telling you how you can use the anointing in the house of God. Isn't that what's happening? Around the globe, isn't that what's happening? And you will see, you know why? Because we have Ephraim, wind and so on. Hosea chapter 13 and verse 15. Though he is fruitful among his brethren, the east wind shall come and the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness and his spring shall become dry. And his fountain shall be dried up. Ephraim, Ephraim, even though you are fruitful. You are very smart, Ephraim. You are smarter than all the others. You are smarter than all the others, Ephraim. But you know what? There is an east wind that is come. You know why? I will tell you why in Hosea chapter 4. And verse 16. 17. Hosea 4.17 You know what God is saying? Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. What is God talking about? Ephraim has joined himself with idols. He says, leave him alone. You don't have to join with any idol to preach the word of God. The word of God has power in itself. People get convicted. People get saved because of the word of God, not because of anything else. You don't have to take anything from the word and join it with the word to have effect. Ephraim has sold himself to the world. He has joined himself with the idols. And God is saying, leave him alone. A instrument is coming upon Ephraim. There will be wilderness and there will be famine on Ephraim. Hello, who are you talking about? Whom are you talking about? You're talking about Ephraim? But Lord, wasn't Ephraim the younger one? When Jacob before his death, when Joseph brought Ephraim and Manasseh before him, and Manasseh was the elder one, and Ephraim was the younger one, when Joseph put his hands upon Ephraim and Manasseh, then Jacob crossed his hands and blessed Ephraim with a double blessing. Wasn't Ephraim who got the double blessing? And is it about that Ephraim God you are saying? Yes, 
Ephraim, you're smarter than your brethren, but wilderness and famine is coming upon you. You can have all the promises of God upon you. You can have all the blessings of God upon you. But if you don't walk in obedience, all those one day will go to naught. And you read the book of Jerusalem. Sorry, the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation and you find about the 144 who are sealed. 144 who are thousand who are sealed. 12,000 from Reuben. 12,000 from each of the tribes. You know what? Ephraim is missing. Ephraim is not mentioned when those 144,000 is sealed. Yet Ephraim was the one who received the double portion. Yet when the 144,000 is mentioned, two tribes are missing. Dan and Ephraim are missing. Levi who had no inheritance through the Bible, when it comes to revelation, Levi is included. Joseph and Manasseh becomes two other tribes. Dan and Ephraim have been removed. Yet how did Ephraim begin? You know why? Because the east wind started blowing upon him. And by the time we come to Revelation, the end of the age, Ephraim is gone. We have only seen the beginning. We are somewhere in the middle, towards the end. We haven't seen the end. And God is asking, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? These 144,000 people are called those who did not defile themselves with women. Don't take it literally. That's not what it is meaning. Every time the word women is used, woman is used in the Bible, either it's Babylon or the apostate church. These 144,000 may be a symbolic number, are the numbers of people who did not get into denom denominations. And their first loyalty was not to the church, their loyalty was to Jesus Christ. They are the ones who are sealed in the land of Goshen. When the east wind starts blowing in the last days, the ones who are sealed. They will say, Lord, if my denomination disagrees with your word, I choose to walk with your word, I walk away. They haven't defiled themselves with the women. The woman in the Bible, in Revelation, is the apostate church or Babylon. Otherwise, then women who didn't have any chance. It's not talking about women, it's talking about men and women who have made their loyalty to Jesus Christ paramount in their life. Denominations are not from God. Denominations have its use and its purpose. But if your loyalty is to your denomination and to, to Jesus Christ, then you are in trouble. If your loyalty is to me, tomorrow when I go wrong, you will still follow me. But if your loyalty is to Jesus Christ, when the pulpit goes wrong, walk out of this place. Don't stay here. Because in this place, he takes preeminence in all things. That is what will keep you till the end because even the very elect themselves will be shaken when the east wind blows. When the east wind blows, when the east wind blows, the very elect themselves will be shaken. He will have no idea what is yet to come. We are living like Jonah. The storm is blowing. The mariners are afraid. Jonah is fast asleep. Jesus also slept in the storm. But that was with absolute peace, knowing that he was in the center of his father's will. Amen. And here he is in the center of disobedience and rebellion and sleeping a sleep of sloth. And believers, we are the ones who know the signs of the times. He says, the mysteries are given to you. I'm giving you the signs. I'm telling you, watch these signs. And when these signs are appearing, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. We are the signposts. Yet the world is worried. They are afraid. And their trash boat is sinking. We are all sleeping happily. We are sleeping. God says, awake. Awake. All those of you who have put your trust, all those of you who have put your trust. There's so much on the east wind. I can't do, a, it's an entire sermon in itself. What have you filled your stomach with? What have you filled your stomach with? Job 15.2 says, have you filled your stomach with the east wind? When you open your mouth, do you have a reason for your hope? Are you able to stay in your churches or your youth meetings or your colleges or your workplaces and able to testify about Jesus? Do you have a reason and a hope or are you people without hope? Or have you filled your stomach with 
the east wind. And then you mouth big words. The big words do not save people. Only the gospel saves people. Only the gospel saves people. When the second world war ended. Little economics. When the second world war ended. The lucky nation was US. Though they lost a lot of their young men, they bankrolled the Second World War. They were not touched, except for Pearl Harbor, they were in touch much by the Second World War. They had money. When the Second World War entered, suddenly the world became much smaller. And the currency of international trading became the dollar. You know that? Now I am the only American here. I am not American. Okay? I am the only American. You are all different nations. And I got the dollar. You want to buy petrol? Buy it in dollar. You want to buy clothes? Buy it in dollar. You want to wheat? Buy it in dollar. Buy it in dollar. You know what? You need to work to earn your dollars. You need to work to earn your dollars. You need to work to earn your dollars. You need to export to get your dollars. For me, I just have to print dollars. You have never understood how the world economy is being run for the past 40, 50 years. America has been printing and printing and printing and printing billions and trillions of dollars. When we talk about our riches, we say we have 300 billion dollars of foreign reserves. And when China talks about this, we have a trillion dollars in American reserves. But you know what? If tomorrow trading changes from dollar to euro, the whole world economy will crash because our money will be worth nothing. When America says we will hit Iran, we will hit Iran, however changes, they said it Bush was the problem. But Obama comes also, he's keeping Iran on the line. They never take off the fact that we will hit Iran. You know why? Because Iran is trying to shift trading from dollar to euro. They say your ships will hit you. Because we can survive it. The economy changes from dollar to something else. Because then everybody's reserves goes down. We will have chaos and who will be protected? You know what will happen? People will stand in the line. They have no money. We have no food. Go up. Government, give us stamps. Food stamps. You stood in America in 1930s. Line families stood with food stamps to get food. People stood in lines to get food. People will stand once again all over the world in lines to get food because suddenly your money has no value, your money has no power, the government has got more and more control over everything. And then you will be willing to take any mark to buy your money, food. When a child is starving in your house, when your baby is crying for milk, you will say, what mark do you want me to take? And you will not even know that you have taken your mark. Because you have walked away from the provision of God. When the east wind blew over Egypt, over one place, over Goshen, God's hand was there and he protected his people. And he still says, I will protect my people if you walk in obedience. You can come to my spiritual Goshen, you will never have to take the mark. That's what we are trying to prepare people for. It's not like the way you see. Things are shaking, things are shaking. Stimulus plan, one trillion dollars. They are not going to get the stimulus back into rails. It's not going to happen. It may happen for two years, three years. It's going to crash one way or other. Nations where so ups in the world are crashing. Nobody knows what to do. Yet there is a God who says, I know what you need to do. Put your trust in me. 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 Don't walk down that road. Don't walk down that road, he says. Don't move away from Jerusalem to Jericho. He says, don't go down that road from Jerusalem to Jericho. A certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was waylaid by thieves. Oh, the thief has come to steal, to kill, to destroy. And how did he leave him? He left him wounded and half dead on the road. He left him wounded and half dead on the road and the priest came. The priest can't do anything. Because his denomination doesn't give you any hope. Only the word of God gives you hope. If the denomination has the word of God, there is still hope. But if the denomination doesn't preach the word of God and keeps people happy by giving them a 10 minute message on something that has no relevance to life and sends them out, when judgment comes, they will have no hope. So the priest looked at him and walked away. Then came the Levite. The Levites also came. They also have no hope. 
because you are half dead and you've been wounded. He also walked away. And then came the Samaritan. A Samaritan? Half breed? Married to a Gentile? Oh yes, Joshua, Jesus is married to a Gentile. Did you know that? Jesus is the type of Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph took a Gentile bride. Jesus took a Gentile bride. We are not Hebrew, we are Gentiles. He took a Gentile bride. So he is a Samaritan. He is the good Samaritan who is coming. And he looks at that man. He walks over to that man and he does two things. He pours wine and oil. Have you ever had wine being poured on your guts? Oh, it bites. Oh, it will bite. You will jump three feet up into the height when the wine gets into your wounds. But I will tell you, the word of God will bite in the beginning, but will bring healing at the end. Hallelujah. It will not always bite in the beginning, but then the wound will turn blue and you will be healed. You know why? Because we are all there standing as six empty, dead stone jars. There is a wedding inside. We are standing there, dead stone jars. Six is the number of man. You reach your perfection, mankind, you will be still a dead stone, empty. And then the good Samaritan comes. The Lord comes and he says, pour water into the stone jars. Pour water into the stone jars. And when they pour the water of God into the stone jars, you know what happens? The stone jars, Paul says, becomes, Peter says, living stones. It becomes living stones. When the water from those living stones flow into the lives of others, it becomes sweet tasting wine. It became sweet tasting wine. That's what God is calling us. The good Samaritan came and he poured wine into his wounds. And then he anointed with the Holy Ghost. And he went to the innkeeper. He put him on his own beast. He didn't leave him on the road. The good Samaritan will never leave you on the road. He will take you and put you on his own beast. You know what? In King David, after whose line the good Samaritan came, when it was time for him to go, he told, take my son Solomon, put him on my own beast and take him so that all the people will know he is king. The good Samaritan is not calling us just for healing. He saying, I am giving you sonship. Come and sit on my own beast and go as royalty to the inn. The inn is the ecclesia or the church. It's the church. And he comes over and he tells every innkeeper in the world, every shepherd in the world, he tells them, here, I'm giving you two dinarai. Two dinarai. Take care of him. A dinarai is one day's wages in the Roman system. Two thousand years and I will come back. Take care of them for 2,000 years. A day is a year, my Lord, Peter says. I have put you in charge of them for two days. And two days later, I will come back. And then for whatever you have done for my broken, wounded one, I will recompense you, brother. I will recompense you. That's what God is telling to anybody who has been wounded on the wayside. Who has been lying on the wayside, God is telling you today. There is a Samaritan, a good Samaritan who will not walk up. If you took your journey, your road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and you went down, God is saying, I am coming. I am there, and I am bringing wine and oil. He is the balm of Gilead. Oh, he will not only bandage us, he will put us on his own beast, and he will take us and put us in a safe place. And then when the time comes, God says, I will reward you. That's what we are preparing for. And that's what you and I need to do. When you go out, don't go to sleep. In the midst of the storm, when all the storm happens, and the mariners are all scared, and you know what they're all doing? They are throwing all the things from the ship overboard. And you know what? The riches of the ship is being thrown overboard. They wake up in the morning. First thing they look at is the stock market. Crashed even more. More of my wealth has gone down. What is happening? Next day, check it. Again, the stock market has. Government is pumping money. The stock market is still going down. They are still pumping more money. The stock market is, you know what? The mariners are throwing. The people terrified in the world are throwing their money overboard. The one who can speak words of hope and salvation to them is sleeping soundly in the middle. And the shipmaster comes and says, How can you sleep like that? Today the master of the ship is coming and telling you and me, how can you sleep like this? 
shouldn't be who shouldn't be you on your knees praying what kind of a man are you these gentiles who do not know the god calling on to their god how can you speak like this and god is telling his people are you praying are you praying are you praying are you praying because there is a storm that is blowing and it's blowing from the east it has to blow from the east it has to blow from the west it has to blow from the south then finally only it will blow from the north and when it blows flows from the north it says in the song of solomon you bring the incense the fragrance of the garden to me then when it flows from the north you and i if you are there will smell like his son my beloved the north wind is blowing and i can get the fragrance every wind there is a message in the bible every wind denotes an act a working of god and as we study the word of god as we study the word of god you shouldn't get depressed you should get encouraged how there is much more to life than what you and i am seeing are you getting the message today are you mess- getting the message today because jesus said to the end generation only one sign i give you the sign of jonah only one sign i give you the sign of jonah the sign of jonah means many things it's not just three days and three nights it's also that you will sleep in the middle of the storm that's the saddest thing of christians in the last generation they are sleeping they are not very much bothered If you have doubts go to the churches in Europe and US they're all empty magnificent structures 10 people sitting in the front and the youngest will be 65 years old <laughs> I'm not joking I'm telling you about people who have gone to those churches and told me we don't need structures we don't need structures it's because the shepherds sold them to an idol book of zachariah says if you sell yourself to an idol or shepherd i will strike your right hand and your right eye you will lose your strength and you will lose your vision then there is no vision and no strength the people will go you do not need to sit there why go over there he has no strength or vision why listen to him as well sit at home and watch tv you know why the god has struck the shepherd from their right hand on their right hand because they join their hearts and the spirit to the idol of this world god is still calling his people to come to me come to me come to me to pray